They're beautiful, like the flowers of the sea. There are many of them. They're dangerous. A few are deadly to humans. They're the horror of beaches around the world. It starts with a cramp after an electric shock, then like burning. Are their numbers in the world's oceans increasing? They can reproduce very quickly. One jellyfish can produce 15,000 eggs in a day. Is that a just punishment for the irresponsible actions of mankind? The oceans are sick and jellyfish are benefiting. The explosion of their population is just the unspoken language the jellyfish express to us human beings as a warning sign. Scientists from all around the world are studying these creatures. They want to explore the secrets of jellyfish, the medusas of the seas, in their laboratories. We're off the coast of Japan. The first time it attracted attention was in 2002. Nomura's jellyfish, a veritable giant, with a diameter of two meters. It looks like an alien. Not much is known about the life cycle of these animals with tentacles as thick as macaroni. The German scientist Cornelia Jaspers meets Shinichi Ua from Japan. He's considered the leading expert of the international jellyfish scene. The plankton expert wants to find out more about the phenomenon of the giant jellyfish in the Sea of Japan. Their appearance en masse is a sign that something's not right in the world's oceans. The eerie invasion of the giant jellyfish scares Japan's fishermen in particular. Professor Ui shows us news footage seemingly straight from a horror film. When the, the jellyfish comes in large numbers, uh, the, their net broken and the burst, and then the fishermen lose a huge money. It's very difficult for the fishermen to do the solution, but the, maybe the science will give some uh, the, the cue to do it. Uh, well, we scientists know where the jellyfish come from, and then the way they are abundant, so we would like to give such information to the fishermen as early as possible. The marine ecologist has discovered that the large swarms come from China. The coastal waters there are exposed to intensive human influences. The ocean is being overfished and polluted. The jellyfish, weighing 200 kilograms, then drift on the current to the Japanese coast. Barcelona. The elite in jellyfish research are meeting at the Jellyfish Bloom Symposium. The scientists from all around the world want to study the seemingly unstoppable growth of these gloopy animals. Their field of research is esoteric. There aren't many marine biologists in the world who study jellyfish. Are humans responsible for the current explosion in jellyfish numbers? It's a question plankton expert Cornelia Jaspers and her colleagues discuss at the symposium. She has good international connections. She's hoping for new leads. She's using her stay in Barcelona to visit Josep Maria Gili. His renowned lab aquariums are home to dozens of species of different ages. Uh, uh, uh. 
They're of interest for basic research. Jellyfish are true survivalists. They've inhabited our world's oceans for 600 million years. Science underestimated jellyfish for decades. In fact, they were positively avoided. Jellyfish were always ignored in studies, but because they attract a lot of attention in our harbors and on our beaches, there's a perception that we have far more jellyfish than we used to. Sadly, we don't have systematic long-term data, so we can't answer that question. Jellyfish don't have a brain or a heart. When they swim, their ring-shaped muscles constrict. Their bodies, made of supportive jelly, are only held together by two thin layers of cells. Jellyfish have a hollow space inside. That's also where their stomach's located. Oral tentacles guide the prey from the tentacles through a stomach tube into the interior. Jellyfish experts are discovering more and more of these animals' remarkable skills. The moon jellyfish, Aurelia aurita, occurs in all the seven seas and can form huge swarms. Josep Maria Gilly is particularly worried by one species occurring in the Mediterranean, Pelagia noctiluca, also known as the mauve stinger. It glows in the dark. The biggest problem with the mauve stinger comes from its impact on the entire marine ecosystem. They're predators, they eat zooplankton and fish larvae. But they're also a problem for humans. Currents and wind bring them together in large swarms around our beaches. Contact with our skin causes severe burns. Beaches are regularly closed as a result. On the Catalan coast, beach visitors can use an app to obtain information about which beaches jellyfish have been spotted at. Nobody here wants anything to do with mauve stingers. It's very tricky in the Mediterranean where you have these colorful mauve stingers, which cause serious burns and skin irritation. If you look further afield, in Hawaii, Thailand or Australia, you even have these small box jellies. They have deadly venom. These box jellies have made the global headlines. Those who survive contact with their toxic tentacles suffer from extremely painful wounds. Life-threatening box jellies aren't found off the Spanish Mediterranean coast, but there are mauve stingers. The seaside tourists call these pink medusas the horrors of the beaches. No wonder, because their stings are extremely unpleasant. If they suddenly appear on a beach, relaxed bathing's no longer possible. Most tourists won't go in the water. Veronica Fuentes is the number one contact for the Spanish press when there's a jellyfish plague in the middle of the peak holiday season. There are areas such as the Balearic Islands where you have red flags blowing on a hundred days during the bathing season because there are too many jellyfish in the water. Tourists can't go into the water. That's a huge impairment. The Spanish tourist island of Ibiza is one of the Balearic Islands. It's where Bartolomé Maritua and José Torsala work. They're volunteers with the Protección Civil, the Spanish Civil Protection Office. The two regularly inspect the monitored beaches to determine the number of jellyfish incidents. Nobody here can predict when the swarms occur. In early May, we had a veritable jellyfish invasion in the sea and on the beaches. But since then, it stayed quiet. 
According to our lifeguards, we had no more than three jellyfish incidents per day. We're hoping it'll stay that way for the next season. His colleague has a picture from last spring on his mobile. This is what a real jellyfish invasion in Ibiza looks like. It's an unpleasant sight. There are socoristas, Spanish lifeguards, on all of Ibiza's beaches to look after the holidaymakers. There's a yellow flag today indicating that visitors should take care. Bartolome and Jose ask the lifeguard what the problem is. There aren't any jellyfish in the water, but the wind's causing a strong current, Angel says. But most of the problems at the beach are because of jellyfish. 80% of all beach incidents are jellyfish burns. The two always keep that in mind when they're monitoring the beaches. The mauve stinger could show up at any time. It's unpredictable. In their tentacles, jellyfish have developed the most toxic and most differentiated cellular mechanism in the animal kingdom. Contact with these tentacles activates the cnidocytes. These are tiny cells that discharge explosively on contact. The magnification shows such an explosion. A fine hair is stimulated and opens the lid of the capsule. At 500 times the Earth's gravitational pull, a needle with a tubule penetrates the skin. The venom enters the victim through the tubule. It has to be quick and effective because jellyfish can't afford a long battle to the death with their prey. They would be ripped apart. Sometimes it's humans who get stung. It felt like a cramp after an electric shock than like burning. And that's why it's better to stay in the water, because it's cooling. If you go out into the sun, it burns and hurts much more. You should cool a jellyfish burn right away. David, the lifeguard, knows what he's talking about. He became a jellyfish victim himself just recently. He and his colleagues swear by their first aid measure. They take salt water and add some baking powder, not fresh water, because that would fuel the activity of the venomous capsules. The prepared anti-jellyfish burn mix is always at hand at their observation post. And that's salt water with baking soda. It's better than vinegar. The baking soda is alkaline and neutralizes the toxins in the jellyfish tentacles. It renders them harmless and lessens the pain. Angel wears rubber gloves to protect himself from potential tentacle fragments. We always use some bandage to rub the skin. But you could use something like a credit card too. We use it to scrape the toxic cells of the skin. Many a beach visitor complains about faintness and allergic reactions after contact with jellyfish. The lifeguards have to call an ambulance that takes the victims to the expert in the island clinic as quickly as possible. When we get patients like that, we give them external use antihistamines. In the case of an allergic reaction, or a cortisone cream for pain. If the affected area is somewhat larger or the allergic reaction is very strong, then patients should take the medicine orally. The American National Science Foundation 
estimates that around 150 million people a year are affected by jellyfish. It's a disaster for Mediterranean regions dependent on their holidaymakers. The authorities and tourism industry are constantly searching for solutions. On the Côte d'Azur, the solution some beaches have taken to isn't exactly a visual enrichment to the landscape. It looks more like a barrier put in place after an oil spill. Hermetically sealed, netted cages for swimmers bathing in the sea without jellyfish. But swimming behind this barrier comes with a price. It's tricky to keep jellyfish out. The net has to reach to the seabed everywhere and be firmly anchored so it withstands currents and storms. The jellyfish nets were tested in recent years in a European project. They're very expensive to acquire, install and maintain. It takes up a lot of time, and the nets don't really do a lot. They also produce other problems. They're not the solution. It's not just humans who get too close to jellyfish. A hundred thousand salmon were affected in Northern Ireland. Millions of tentacles got into the fish farm. The ocean current had pushed a huge swarm against the netted cages. Jellyfish are even responsible for power outages. When those uh, jellyfishes are coming in swarms, they're blocking our cooling system. Oskarsham nuclear power plant in southern Sweden was forced to shut down on the weekend after large amounts of jellyfish clogged up the pipes carrying cooling water to the turbines. For two days, Tornes nuclear power station has been shut down. The plant relies on water sucked in from the sea to cool its nuclear reactors. But earlier this week, huge clouds of jellyfish brought the station to a standstill. Yeah, Films like that give jellyfish a bad image. Some scientists exploit this and go along with this image, saying jellyfish are bad and we have a problem. But what people don't think about is that jellyfish are characterized by the fact that they go through these cycles. There are years when there are lots of jellyfish and years when we have barely any. That's normal for jellyfish. Plankton expert Cornelia Jaspers wants to find out the truth about jellyfish. She's been doing research around the world for years. My professor talked about small animals that could reproduce within 24 hours, and that really fascinated me. I asked him and he mentioned a trip across the Indian Ocean because they wanted to know their significance in the world's oceans. I agreed to it, and that's how I became fascinated by these jellies in the water. Her research object was transported in the ballast water of large container ships to Europe. Cornelia Jaspers, who's from Hamburg, has been observing the introduced species for almost 10 years. And not just on her doorstep in Kiel on the Baltic, where she currently works. Their population is growing dramatically now in the late summer, she can see individual animals from the jetty. It's worth visiting these marine inhabitants underwater. She doesn't have to search for long. As expected, the animals can be found en masse around the jetty. The warty comb jelly, or sea walnut. Strictly speaking, it's not a jellyfish. Unlike true jellies, it doesn't have cnidocytes. That's why Cornelia can touch them. The scientist has specialized in comb jellies. Their biological name is Nemiopsis lydii. Their natural home is the Atlantic off the American East Coast. Cornelia Jaspers has found out that this species is extremely adaptable and can reproduce at lightning speed. 
Since there's no competition here for food, it can grow incredibly large. This is an example. It's 60, 70 millimeters if you take just the body, and then you have the wings. An animal like this produces 15,000 eggs per day that can fertilize themselves. We have to keep an eye on these wardy comb jellies, even though the salt content in the central Baltic is too low for them. But here it has a super habitat to reproduce. The port of Kiel on the Baltic is the starting point for scientific expeditions all around the world. The Geomar Helmholtz Center for Ocean Research is known well beyond the city. Cornelia Jaspers has come from the Institute for Aquatic Resources at the Technical University of Denmark. In 2006, marine biologists discovered the introduced comb jelly species in the Baltic. That was a shock because in the Mediterranean region their population exploded and also caused huge damage in the ecosystem of the Black Sea. How quickly can the warty comb jelly conquer its new habitat? Is it a threat to the Baltic too? At first glance, they're fascinatingly beautiful. The eight comb jellies shimmer in all the colors of the rainbow. It's only under the microscope that it becomes clear why. Light refracts in all the spectral colors in the tiny transparent disks with which the animal moves around. Cornelia Jaspers has made a frightening discovery. This immigrant can cope so well with the local conditions that it's not just the adults, but young jellies that are reproducing. In the lab, under ideal conditions, it only takes a few days for a freshly hatched larva to reproduce. After months of counting, Jaspers' team found out how many eggs such larvae can produce. Cornelia Jaspers has shown that the ability of the warty comb jelly to reproduce rapidly where it likes the conditions is based substantially on its reproductive qualities. This isn't a native species, so it's important that we keep an eye on it so we know how it's developing and whether it's taking over the ecosystem. That would be disastrous. The Baltic is a nursery for commercially important edible fish such as cod and herring. Are the warty comb jellies eating their young? Cornelia Jaspers performs an experiment. She gives the jellies cod eggs and larvae for food. But the jellyfish doesn't eat the fish eggs. It spits them out again. That's not what happens to very young cod babies. The comb jelly laps them up. The warty comb jelly can eat the fish larvae, but mostly those still in their yolk sac, those that don't yet actively swim. The others are too mobile and can get away from the jellies. That means the warty comb jelly is dangerous. On board the Danish research vessel Dana, the fisheries biologist Bastian Hoover conducts a jellyfish census four times a year. Are the animals a threat to the eggs and larvae of herring and cod? In the jellyfish's original habitat, where it's naturally occurring, along the east coast of North and South America, this jellyfish is notorious for eating fish eggs and larvae. That's why we were worried when we discovered this species here around Bornholm. This area is the main spawning area for Baltic cod. Plankton nets sieve through the water column from the surface to just above the ground. The net is called a bongo net because it looks like bongo drums. We use this larger one mainly to capture fish eggs and larvae. This one catches all kinds of zooplankton, and the baby bongo captures very small organisms. Jellyfish are caught by all of the nets. 
the captain of the Dana is setting the course for the night. Bastian Hoover has to head along the same coordinates every time so that the results gathered can be compared long term. If we zoom in again, we can see the islands of Bornholm, Rügen and Fehrmarn. Our bases are more in the eastern area. I thought we'd start with the transect in the Arcona Basin and then we'll work our way over. For several nights, the research ship travels along the set GPS coordinates. The captured zooplankton gathers at the end of the net in a catch bag. The main thing we're interested in is how many jellyfish we have in the samples and how many fish eggs and larvae. The Dana is heading towards the next spot check coordinate. Bastian Hoover takes care of his catch. A school of sticklebacks feasts on the zooplankton that Bastian Hoover has to count. They have to be removed first. Under the microscope, the different species of zooplankton can be identified. Tiny copepods along with fish eggs and larva, great for the jellyfish. A measuring probe is lowered into the water at every station. They determine the oxygen and salt content along with the temperature. A vertical profile of the environmental data arrives live on Bastian Hoover's screen. The graphs indicate salty, oxygen-rich layers. Water from the North Sea has found its way to the Eastern Baltic through deep channels. That suggests that the warty comb jellies came to the Bornholm region on this saltwater current. At the moment, we don't believe this jellyfish has had a big impact on the fish populations here in the eastern Baltic, because it hasn't appeared en masse anywhere. In addition, the jellyfish doesn't show up during the main cot spawning season. So it's all clear? Cornelia Jaspers says definitely not. The victory of the warty comb jellies in Europe is taking place in two waves of immigration. The animals that appeared for the first time down here in the Black Sea originate from the Gulf of Mexico. The animals we have up here in the Baltic, they've come from Boston, Woods Hole, that area. That's been proved genetically. These were two completely distinct invasions. What happens when the warty comb jellies from the Black Sea are introduced into the Baltic? The animals occur in the southwestern Baltic and in the Kattegat between Denmark and Sweden. We have quite high densities here, but these jellies haven't conquered the majority of the Baltic. If we can show that the southern species has a different genetic repertoire and can cope with a lower salt content, that could be a threat if the southern ones transferred north. On the other hand, we don't know what would happen if the southern and northern jellies were brought together. We could get super potent hybrids, or we could get hybrids that can't reproduce. It's a very exciting question that's really significant for the future of the Baltic. That's why the scientist is bringing warty comb jellies from America, the Black Sea and the Baltic together in the lab. She'll carry out evolutionary and breeding experiments over the next few years. Funded by the EU's Marie Curie programme and the Danish Council for Independent Research for Natural Sciences. With this international support, the plankton scientist hopes to find out whether the mysterious jelly superpower is continuing on its path towards dominance and whether it can win over as yet unconquered areas. On the Côte d'Azur in Villefranche-sur-Mer, the marine biologist Fabien Lombard works for the Observatoire Oceanographique. For 
The jellies aren't scary to me. They're beautiful organisms. I think they're like flowers of the sea. They have beautiful tentacles and bodies. Their way of life is very zen to me. Anyone who speaks that positively about jellyfish has to have a reason. The location of his office, for example, it's from here that he decides whether it's worth capturing a few of his research objects. Today's a good day. The mauve stinger is the dominant species in the Mediterranean on the Côte d'Azur. Fabien Lombard needs a few for his experiments in the laboratory. The jellyfish aren't as terrible as people think. They've been at home in the world's oceans for a very long time, for more than 600 million years. Sometimes they're there, sometimes not. They play an important role as predators in the ocean. They could be useful to us humans. We have to learn to live with them, even though there are too many of them sometimes. Sometimes we can use them. Lombard has an unusual idea. He sucks up large quantities of slime that the mauve stinger releases when laying its eggs, or the moon jellyfish when stressed. He fills the slime into test tubes for a brilliant experiment. He injects water polluted with nanoparticles into the jellyfish slime, dyed purple here. The result, the jellyfish slime causes the nanoparticles to clump together, which cleans the polluted water. There are more and more nanoparticles, in creams, for example. The factories that manufacture these things have to take care of their wastewater. They have to get rid of it without polluting the environment. You could use the jellyfish slime to filter nanoparticles out of polluted water. It would be cheap and environmentally friendly. Will this rescue the jellyfish's reputation? Zabino Host on Heligoland wants to understand the mysterious double lives of jellyfish. For decades, she's been researching the reproduction strategy of true jellyfish. To do that, she needs the help of the divers from the Alfred Wegener Institute. The team's out to look for jellyfish polyps. They prefer to live on the underside of substrates, which means we have to look from below. That's how we can find them. There are five North Sea species floating under the dive ship. Apart from the hermaphrodite compass jellyfish, all the species have males and females. The sperm is released into the water and is taken on by the females. The eggs are fertilized internally. Jellyfish larvae develop. The true jellyfish release these planulae into the ocean in shifts. The jellyfish larvae are covered in many tiny filaments, which they use to swim to a solid surface to attach themselves to. The planula develops into a polyp. Under very specific conditions, the polyps release many little jellyfish called ephyra. They grow into sizable medusas. The cycle starts afresh. It's an extremely effective reproductive strategy. The polyps survive for several years on the hard ground that the divers will search in a minute.
They don't have a skeleton. If the sandy soil moves around them, it would break them down. That's why they need a hard substrate where they can settle safely. They don't like sandy soils. But because we're introducing hard substrates in places where we used to have sand, with concrete for platforms, for example, we increase the places where planula can settle and develop polyps, and then jellyfish can grow. Offshore facilities are being built all over the world to cover humankind's huge demand for energy. Huge structures underwater provide new settlement areas distribution springboards. They include markers for shipping, along with concrete harbour structures and breakwaters. A dive down the sheet piling reveals how popular human structures are for marine inhabitants. Every square centimetre is occupied. The diver tries to find the polyps in this jungle on the harbour's sheep piling. She takes a sample from a likely location. On the way back, her colleague hits a lion's main jellyfish, a Cyanea capillata. Fortunately, the diver is wearing a full face mask Otherwise, he would have been badly stung. I hope it's a female with larvae so we can harvest the larvae and raise polyps in the lab. Then we can study the polyps and find out when they produce jellyfish and under what conditions. The jellyfish and the sample are taken to the lab. The environmental conditions in the sea are changing. The reason is climate change. The increase in greenhouse gas concentrations is warming our atmosphere. The ocean absorbs the heat. That's an increase of 1.7 degrees for the North Sea alone. Global warming is also a subject at the Jellyfish Bloom Symposium in Barcelona. Jaspers and Holst are meeting an expert. The scientist Jennifer Purcell has been researching the dynamic between jellyfish populations and their polyps for the past 40 years. When you give them higher temperatures, they produce more jellyfish. Um, dramatically more jellyfish than they do in the cooler waters. Increasing air pollution as a result of industry and traffic is leaving its mark. There's too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Since the Industrial Revolution, the world's oceans have absorbed half of the carbon dioxide. The gas dissolves in the oceans, reducing their pH value. Our oceans are becoming more acidic, all organisms with a calcium-based skeleton are in danger because the acidic water dissolves the limestone. Jellyfish don't have a skeleton, therefore the acidification of the oceans isn't a problem for them. They survive. Jennifer Purcell lists even more negative environmental influences. Too much fertilizer from agriculture, the nutrients get into the oceans via our groundwater and rivers. This causes phytoplankton blooms. These tiny algae form huge carpets as seen from space. This vegetable fodder produces all the more zooplankton. Zooplankton is made up of microscopically small animals and fish larvae. This is what jellyfish eat, allowing them to reproduce in great numbers. This is causing eutrophic conditions with lots of nutrients in the water. Uh, it leads to low oxygen levels and um, jellyfish are very tolerant of those conditions. At the same time, the global jellyfish victory in the oceans is a threat to their food competition, fish.
fishing samples from the Baltic on the Danish research vessel Dana. Even a cursory glance tells the scientists that there are too few female cod able to spawn. They've been overfished by the Baltic fishing fleets. The Danes are counting on behalf of ICES, the International Council for the Exploration of the Sea, which monitors 110 fish species around the world. Their data is included in the annual recommendation for EU fishing quotas. Both the young fish and the small schooling fishes like herring are eating the zooplankton, um, the little tiny animals that swim around in the water. So both of those are being consumed by jellyfish and fish, then you're taking away the fish. So that leaves more food for the jellyfish to eat. Zabina Holst is on her way to the lab on Heligoland. The breakwaters made of tetrapods are like a red carpet for the jellyfish larvae. She finds plastic rubbish on the beach. Millions of tons of plastic waste find their way into the oceans around the world. The current makes sure that the pieces of plastic drift around in the water for a long time, a habitat for jellyfish polyps. All the hard substrates we put into the oceans, including plastic waste, are places that organisms can live on. We've shown in lab experiments that jellyfish polyps settle on artificial substrates, including plastic. She takes care of the recently captured jellyfish female. She tries to settle her planulae. She fills small containers with water from the North Sea. The sex cells, eggs and sperm, are produced in the gonads. The male releases the sperm into the water where it's absorbed by the females. The fertilization process takes place inside the female. The fertilized eggs turn into larvae. They move into the brooding pouches where the planulae develop before they're released. She carefully siphons off the larvae and offers them an upside-down plastic lid that they can settle on. The lab cellar of the Alfred Wegener Institute is the scene of a successful settlement experiment, the Heligoland polyp culture. Three species are located here at a temperature of 15 degrees. Most of the time they're upside down and in the dark on the plastic lids. Sabino Hoss wants to use the polyps of the blue jellyfish for her experiments. They're only fed once a week. That's enough for them to live. Die füttern wir mit we feed them with brine shrimps. We add them to the water and the polyps catch them with their tentacles. At some point, they pinch off little Ephira. A new generation of jellyfish is born. It's time for the sample the divers took. The scientist finds what she was expecting. She finds the branching jellyfish polyps of the Anthomedusa in amongst the algae, barnacles and moss animals. The Heligoland Biological Institute has sent a measuring boat out to sea almost daily since 1962. For one of the longest running long-term marine data collection programs, the scientists take water and plankton samples. If the environmental conditions change, that can be reflected in the composition of the ocean plankton. Jellyfish could even benefit from that.
We know that the jellyfish polyps are very resistant to changes in the environment, and that means that the polyps survive environmental conditions that other organisms can't survive. The Atlantic. The Sargasso Sea is situated far off the coast of North America. The Danish research vessel Dana is on an eel expedition. Cornelia Gaspers doesn't believe in the negative image jellyfish have. Together with an international team of fisheries biologists and plankton experts, she wants to prove that gelatinous plankton plays an enormously important role in the food chain for the endangered European eel, for example. Everyone's surprised that eel are becoming more expensive. They're threatened by extinction. One connection nobody's really making is that jellyfish, which have a negative image, could be a potential building block in the food chain. Without them, we might have no more eels to eat. The net for catching eel larvae is lifted from a depth of 250 meters. The first glance proves that there are many species of gelatinous plankton organisms here. In amongst them, the scientists discover the mysterious eel larvae that emerge from the egg here in the Sargasso Sea. This size wouldn't survive in an aquaculture because nobody knows what these baby eels eat. That's why no one has ever been successful at breeding European eels. The multi-net is lifted on board. It catches samples from several depths between zero and 400 meters. The plankton expert, Cornelia Gaspers, is needed. After hours of rinsing, counting and identifying, it becomes clear what organisms contribute to the food chain out here in the Sargasso Sea. We're catching small eel larvae to cut them open. We're going to take out the stomach and we're going to use molecular methods to determine what they eat. Jellyfish don't have skeletons. As a result, they get digested immediately. That makes it really hard to use normal methods like microscopes to demonstrate such organisms. Now we have molecular methods so we can find out what gelatinous organisms are in their stomachs and what gelatinous organisms are in the water, and then we can hopefully match the two up. Do eel larvae eat jellyfish? Proving that is quite elaborate. The meticulous counting job on board is only the first step for Cornelia Jaspers and her colleagues. The analysis of the data will take several years. Only then will the results be ready for publication. Is it jellyfish that feed our important edible fish in the nursery? That would be a breakthrough for science, and the key not just for rescuing the European eel, but also for other endangered fish species such as bluefin tuna. The Jellyfish Bloom Symposium is an important event for exchange for the scientists. Jellyfish research is still in its infancy. There are no uniform methods yet, the kind that are long established in fisheries biology. I think it's a really nice uh, sign that there are so many young people involved yeah. now. Um, that's a very positive sign. So if there are a lot of postdocs and uh, master students involved, that, that means that there's an interest, a growing interest. And that is what has been lacking the past years, I think. We still need to find out why uh, there is some growing population at some point on the planet. Uh, we have a lot of indications, but of course it needs long studies, dedicated studies, or even very strong experimental studies that for the moment are still lacking. And there is a lot of monitoring uh, issues, uh, monitoring programs that have started that need to be continued to really understand what is going on. What's clear is that the medusas are an important indicator for the decline of the oceans. 
a problem caused by humans. Of course, the jellyfish has no the words to say the human beings, but the explosion of their population is just the unspoken language uh, that the, fish, uh, the jellyfish express to us human beings as a warning sign. I believe that all of us are responsible, of course, for, for spreading this information and also for realizing that we cannot uh, keep doing things in the way we are doing now. The mysterious world of jellyfish. They've been around for 600 million years, making them the oldest marine inhabitants on our planet. They've never actually conquered it. Their unusual qualities enrich the diversity in our oceans.